Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about Shock, my newest actively controlled model rocket. Shock had its first test flight recently, and I have a lot of awesome video to show you. Just as a quick overview, the vehicle is just under a meter long. It is three inches in diameter and weighs about 1,100 grams without motors. It flew on a CTI G33 for its first launch to just shy of 100 meters, which is about the third the altitude is supposed to get to, but we'll get into that later. Um, before we dig into the flight, let's talk about the rocket itself. Shock is constructed a lot like most model rockets. It has an avionics bay near its nose and a motor mount in the back, and it's recovered by a pair of parachutes in the middle. It is almost entirely 3D printed, with the exception of the body tubes and couplers, plus some recovery hardware. It has three sets of fins. First is the mid-body wings, then there's a pair of small fins I call waist fins, and then the aftmost fins, which are controlled by servos. A long raceway runs from the avionics bay in the nose to the fin servos in the tail, which hide the servo power and signal cables. The raceway has to separate in the middle to allow parachute deployment, which is something that took a long time to figure out. Uh, so first let's talk about the avionics bay. The big white PCB is the primary flight computer. I made these about a year and a half ago and are basically a custom Teensy 3.6 using the Teensy bootloader and the K66 processor. Uh, the flight computer has two IMUs or inertial measurement units, which give both acceleration and angular velocity data for the vehicle. Connected to the flight computer is the camera interface board. This is a small PCB I made to turn on power to and control via UART up to four cameras. For this flight, the only things on it that mattered were a voltage regulator to power the cameras and a MOSFET that turns them on. The cameras draw a pretty considerable amount of power, and leaving them on is a great way to drain your battery while you just sit on the pad. This flight flew with two cameras, both run cam split HDs. One of these looks sideways, and the other looks down at the fins via a mirror assembly mounted external to the AV bay. On the other side of the flight computer are the camera control boards. These little PCBs come with the cameras and have a little processor on them and a micro SD card slot where the camera records its footage. Above the main avionics bay is the ACES mount and control board. ACES, or the Attitude Control Engine System, is an experimental device with four side-facing 13mm rocket motors, which can be fired rapidly to change the rocket's attitude. The ACES control board is connected via I2C to the main flight computer and has all of the I.O. needed for continuity detection and to arm and fire these rocket motors. For this flight, ACES flew in disabled mode, and there were no ACES motors installed. Before ACES flies in an active state, ground testing has to be done to make sure that I can reliably arm, fire, and safe these motors, and to test out the various control modes that ACES uses. Below the flight computer is a small board that breaks out servo power and control for the raceway and a 900 megahertz telemetry radio that lets me do uplink commanding and receive downlink telemetry. Attached to the main body tube are the mid-body wings. These probably do more harm than good, but I designed them to help with some future control modes by increasing the lift coefficient for the whole vehicle. To reduce weight and improve the vehicle's stability, these will probably be removed for flight test too. Below them are the waste fins. These are little modular fins that can be replaced or changed to increase or decrease the rocket's static margin. They slot into a little 3D printed CF nylon insert that's epoxied to the inside of the body tube, so they're pretty sturdy. I'm trying to keep the static margin about the same for every flight, but when we fly with ACES motors or larger main rocket motors, the CG moves forward and backwards a bit. So by replacing these fins, I can keep my static margin constant and reuse some of the same control gains, which will be nice. Below the waste fins is the motor and fin mount. This is a large 3D printed structure that serves as the motor mount and holds the actuated fins. A whole bunch of screws hold the structure in the body tube and its base acts as a thrust ring transferring load from the main motor into the base of the body tube. Another small PCB breaks out the power and control wires to each servo and makes it easy to plug and unplug the raceway cable so I can remove the entire motor mount mechanism in one piece. The fins actuate about 20 degrees in both directions via a linkage mechanism which gives them about a two and a half to one gear ratio from the servo. I call the style of fin mount a dual bearing, fully restrained design, as each fin has a pair of bearings on which it rotates, with a restraining mechanism that prevents the fin from being pulled out along its axis of rotation. In this cutaway, viewed from the bottom, you can see the top of the fin itself here, which is screwed into the rotation mechanism here after the fin mount is slid into the body tube. The rotation mechanism is restrained from moving outwards by this piece here, which connects to the servo linkage and finally to the servo itself. Previous designs of fin mounts had plastic on plastic rotation, which always gave me a few degrees of backlash, and the rotation mechanism would experience a lot more friction when the fin is under load, but the bearings in this design solved both of those issues. 
So that is shock in the configuration it was in for its first test flight. Now let's take a look at some launch footage. Five, four, three, two, one, launch. So as you all saw, there was a pretty hard pitch over right after liftoff, got hit by a big gust of wind as soon as it left the rail. Uh, we can dive into why I think that happened and how to fix it at the very end of the video. But for now, we're going to watch the down looking camera view. Unfortunately, this camera became unfocused. I think it's focused too closely um, between testing and then flight. So this is going to be a fuzzy video, but hopefully it shows us some interesting stuff here. Um, so yeah, this is the down looking video in full speed. So that went pretty quick. Uh, I'd like to watch this video again in slow-mo and just talk through some of the things that I noticed when I watched it and some of the things that I think are important. This camera didn't record in slow motion, but we're just going to walk through it at a quarter of the frame rate. So here's liftoff, and we can see as soon as we leave the rail, we start a pitch over, and we're very quickly pointed out at the horizon. One of the big culprits here, I think, is that this vehicle has a pretty large mass moment of inertia on its non-longitudinal axes. So its natural frequency there is pretty slow, and we weren't going very fast. So there just wasn't enough time for um, the vehicle to recover from the angle of attack it got from that really hefty gust of wind. But as soon as we, get, we got that speed, um, we speed up uh, and the vehicle stabilized. We can see here this kind of corkscrew path that we're uh, flying through the sky. And pretty quickly the motor burns out here. There's more of the corkscrew pattern and then our parachutes deploy. We see both parachutes starting to inflate well clear of each other, which is really good. I was concerned about uh, parachutes getting tangled, but there were, we see the uh, avionics bay parachute fully deployed. There's the main body tube itself floating off uh, in the distance, and we can see the shock cord is becoming unfurled. And by this point, both parachutes are fully deployed, and we're slowly floating down to the ground. So one of the things I was really concerned about was the recovery system. Having two parachutes is great for redundancy, but it does mean that they can get tangled. Uh, there's more views of the parachutes here in the side view in slow-mo again. We can see we, pick, uh, we lift off and then we pitch over pretty quickly. And we're almost pointed out at the horizon here. The vehicle does start to roll. The control system never was active. You saw that the fins never moved in the down-looking camera view. But as soon as we got enough speed, the camera's locked right on the horizon pretty well. And as the camera jolts, that's the recovery system deploying. There's our main body tube floating off in the distance as the shock cord becomes taut. Rotate a little bit, there's the avionics bay parachute fully deployed, slowing us down. And there's the parachute for the main body tube. You can see they're well separated by the kind of riser between them. And we can see that riser in a clearer view here. Fully separating the two vehicles, meaning that our parachutes did not get tangled, which is awesome. And that riser right there stayed taut the entire way to the ground, which meant that our parachutes again stayed well clear of each other all the way down. Uh, having two parachutes again is great for redundancy if that shock cord snaps. Uh, one of them is directly connected to the avionics bay, which holds all of my expensive electronics. So hopefully I'll at least recover that, or I will at least recover the main body tube, which I can you know, replace the avionics bay, which would suck, but at least I would keep half of the rocket in any given failure scenario. So what were the goals for this flight and were they met? There were a lot of new systems to test on this flight. This was a brand new rocket, new motor mount and actuated fin configuration, new avionics bay hardware, new cameras, and a new separable connector system to power and control the servos. Remember, the raceway cable needs to separate where the avionics bay and body tube come apart, so that connection needs to be strong enough to stay together in flight, but be able to separate when the recovery system deploys. 
On top of all of that, a new iteration of my common flight software, new ground control code, and an improved data link were all new systems to test this flight. Also, in theory at least, the rocket would have achieved enough altitude and speed to test its control system on the roll axis as well. Some of these systems performed well. All of the hardware from the motor mount to the recovery system performed great. The parachutes achieved good separation and were about the same altitude in the air as one another, which prevented the shock cord from interfering with and deflating the lower parachute. The camera systems were mostly good. I was able to control the cameras from the ground and they stored data well. I do need to fix the camera focus issue on the down camera, but other than that, they worked great. That being said, some systems need a little improvement. This is a snippet of the text data log produced by the flight computer, one of three files it generates while it's running. You can see here that the vehicle achieves enough speed and altitude to enable the control system only 30 milliseconds before the recovery system deployed, which obviously didn't give it enough time to actually test roll control. Another strange thing is this line here, showing our apogee altitude as NAN. Some fault in the flight control code turned our state vector, which contains the rocket's position and velocity, to all not a numbers on the frame where the control system enabled. This is a weird one. I don't know what happened. It isn't a fault that ever occurred on diamond flights with very similar flight code. I need to do some more testing and try to reproduce the issue, but for now I have a band-aid in the flight code to hopefully correct this if it happens. Every frame after running the common position filter, the computer will now check if the state vector contains any NANs. If it does, it'll default back to the last valid state vector, probably from the previous frame, meaning we lose that one frame of navigation data, but hopefully this will save the vehicle from just throwing an error in flight and changing state. Again, that doesn't actually fix whatever the underlying issue is, so I'll keep testing to see if I can resolve that problem correctly. So what's coming up next? I have some more powerful H42 motors I can fly on, and I'm looking to shave weight off the vehicle here and there. I'll remove the mid-body wings for next flight, and I'm going to replace a lot of the non-load-bearing steel screws I used with nylon ones, which should save, I don't know, maybe 80 grams of weight. It's not much, but combining those two measures should increase the rail exit velocity by about 40%. I'll also make some edits to the flight control code, and hopefully I can test again soon, and we can actually try out roll control. Roll control worked okay on previous flights with canard control rockets, but roll reversal was a problem for me there, and hopefully aft fin control can solve this with the new vehicle. Well, that's all I have for now. So thank you all for watching. Hopefully I can do the next test flight soon, and when I do, I'll definitely make a video about it. So stay tuned for the next one.